Welcome back to The Place of Places, a chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of William Soroyan's 1972 memoir, Places Where I've Done Time. Today, we're staying in New York, but heading over to Governor's Island, New York Harbor, 1943. This chapter is about the Army, that most hated institution to Soroyan, who did not want to be drafted and resented the whole experience claiming that he was a prisoner of the army for three years and suspecting that his time there ended a promising theater career. This anger shows up all over the place in his writing. Governor's Island is in New York Harbor between Manhattan and Brooklyn, and its military use dates to the Revolutionary War. Before that, it was used by Dutch settlers and then British colonial governors in the 1600s. Soroyan was held at Fort Jay, which was built in 1794 and is now part of the Governor's Island National Monument. He might be happy to know that most of the places he was stationed at are no longer run by the Army. He was drafted in 1942 in California, reporting to the Monterey Presidio and then the Signal Corps in Sacramento. He was then assigned to the Army's Film Center at Historic Studios in Astoria, Queens. He was to write scripts for Army training films, but he never accepted writing on someone else's behalf or at their behest and continually created product that the army found unacceptable. For example, he was supposed to write a script for how to load a boxcar, but delayed for months before he wrote the one-line script, it's very easy to load a boxcar. On multiple occasions, he came close to being court-martialed for his insubordination. For the same reasons why he couldn't work for a company, he couldn't behave in the army. His whole life had been lived in a type of disorder, and at age 34, he wasn't about to start respecting authority. Weirdly, Soroyan was initially deferred under a 3A classification because his mother and sister were dependents on his income. But he gave all his earnings to them and was reclassified as 1A, which had no restrictions. Why did Soroyan do this? It's possible that for a moment he actually wanted the chance to write an anti-war novel from the inside, though once entrenched in the organization, found he had made a mistake. When the human comedy was released in 1943, he was receiving press as an enlisted man and was being quoted in newspapers in ways unfavorable to the army. Additionally, the human comedy features the pain of pointlessly losing a loved one to war. This also annoyed the army, so he was sent to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, because he couldn't behave himself in New York. His time in Dayton was brief, but he managed to marry Carol there, and they returned to New York. That's where this chapter comes in. In New York, soldiers in the film center were allowed to live off base if they chose. He was living with a pregnant Carol in a penthouse at 2 Sutton Place South, by the Queensboro Bridge, able to live the high life after making a bundle on the human comedy. At 6 a.m., he was to report for duty in Astoria. The studios had previously been the East Coast hub for Paramount and then a center for independent filmmaking in the 1930s. After reporting, he was given half an hour to eat breakfast, being disgusted by the army rations about which he wrote, the smell made me want to vomit. It did not smell like the world. It smelled like a loathsome sore on a great sick body. He would instead go to a Jewish deli, have a bagel and read the times. When he was promoted to private first class, he refused to wear the chevron on his uniform and was nearly court-martialed until he relented. He was being difficult with the army, and as Carol later told Lee Lawrence for Soroyan's biography, he felt violated by the draft. The army eventually sent him for Section 8 at Halloran Hospital, an army hospital on Staten Island, where it was assessed whether he was mentally fit to serve. It was established that he was pretending to be crazy in order to be discharged, so the Section 8 discharge didn't go through. At this point, with Aram born, Soroyan's confinement in the army was breaking him down mentally. He was becoming more and more of a nuisance to, to the army and not producing any writing that he was enlisted for. To get rid of him, he was sent to London, coinciding with the one-year anniversary of his marriage to Carol. In London, he was supposed to be writing press releases and speeches, but instead he was writing Dear Baby, completely crushed that he couldn't be with his wife and new heir. 
so he concocted a plan to get himself back home, attempting to strike a deal with the army, wherein he would produce a novel for them in exchange for a furlough to New York. He wrote The Adventures of Wesley Jackson about a young soldier from San Francisco who was sent to Dayton and Astoria and mirrored Soroyan in many ways. But it was anti-war, anti-army, and was sympathetic to the enemy, and many officers found it treasonous. Once again, he narrowly escaped court-martial, and the furlough was denied. He writes in letters from 74 Rue Tebu, There was a big Hollywood writer who had become a big army colonel, and somehow he got a copy, hold of a copy of the manuscript of The Adventures of Wesley Jackson. He sent in a report saying that the army should not permit the novel to be published, and furthermore, that I ought to be shot. Breaking the deal to get back to New York was sinful to him, and he caught and caused much mental anguish. He writes in Sons Come and Go, Mothers Hang In Forever, When I went mad in London, a frustrated private in the American army who had worked night and day to write a novel in 39 days because I had been promised that this would get me back to New York on furlough, and I was cheated out of that furlough, exhausted and desperate, and gone off the rocker, I still laughed. The mad also laugh. And in Candid Conversation by Gehrig Basmajian, transcribed from a chat on May 25th, 1975 in Paris, and published in William Soroyan, The Man and the Writer Remembered, Soroyan said, I flipped my wig when I was in the army in London. I was going to kill some of the officers or myself. Suicide is also murder, you understand. I could have gone to the army psychiatrist and I might have killed them, but even then my impulse was to wait. I have some writings from those days which, someday, if I look into it, must be incredible." Wesley Jackson wasn't released until after the war, in 1946, but by then it was cut, being cut down by the army and it wasn't a commercial success. In 1950 he released The Twin Adventures, which combined Wesley Jackson with Soroyan's diary that was written concurrently. He claims that Wesley Jackson is for readers, and the diary, The Adventures of William Soroyan, is for writers, and the diary is a scathing review of army practices and the pressures he was under at the time. This time period in the army not only disrupted his budding theater career, from which it never recovered, but it led to a change in Soroyan that was ultimately rejected by audiences and reflects the beginning of the end of his bright stardom. Back in this chapter, he's reporting to Astoria, being plagued by occasional ac acute muscle pain, he was unable to report for duty on time. He tells us of the dirty tricks that the medical officers played on recruits, that for the right price a medical officer could be paid off to write a medical exemption from dirtier hard work, or better yet, from a larger fee, one could be discharged entirely. Frustrated that enlisted men were given higher positions and lorded it over draftees, he describes how ill-treated he was being sent away to the Fort Jay Hospital on Governor's Island because he had some back pain and wouldn't grease the right palms. I wasn't playing the game, so I was being given the business. It seems that wherever Soroyan went, he was faced with systems of oppression. Whether it was Hollywood, Broadway, or the Army, he kept butting heads with greedy men bent on making money off of his hard work. And I used to believe I had forever, now I'm not so sure, he writes. The kind of world in which crooks become millionaires while kids get killed at war games made me want to get rich without working. This chapter is about fighting the machine, about maintaining a pure spirit. He tells us that he fought the army for three years and won. True, he was insulated and protected by his fame, so he was given cushy jobs and never punished as badly as others. He even begins this chapter, It's a big joke to many people when somebody talks with annoyance about the dirty tricks of the army, because the feeling is, big deal, thousands have been killed, so tell us all about your hard times with the army. The fact is, that one is bored by the army even while one is putting up with its treachery. He knows he could have had it worse, of course, but that doesn't stop him from telling us about the insidious ways that the army allows the general abuse of power at every level. There were plenty of well-known artists who created propaganda for the military during the World War II, including Walt Disney, but this wasn't a possibility for Soroyan, who refused to write proletariat propaganda in the 1930s, despite being urged on by communists, and likewise refused to write for the military. He was his own man and would not be moved by any institution. 
This letter to an army commander is especially moving, and here I read it in its entirety, as it has not been published. To Commander Herbert Agar, it's going to be most difficult for me to write this letter. After twenty months in the army, twenty months of profound spiritual stupor, brought about by amazement at my position, my uselessness, and my feeling of being, on the one hand, pointlessly held prisoner, and on the other, being denied by right as a decent human being and American to do the work for which I am fitted. My thinking is poor, my mind sick, and my spirit outraged. I have begun such a letter as this a hundred times, but I have been overwhelmed by a sense of futility, because I have not known to whom I might speak, and therefore I have neither written the letter nor spoken to anyone. I am afraid I have lost the simple capacity to speak coherently, simply because I am so astounded and embarrassed by the necessity for me to even want to speak for myself. But now, I am afraid, I must speak, and I feel that I must speak to you, for I believe you are concerned with the things here involved, not only in so far as they are related to me, but on principle. I ask you to try to overlook the emotion which is behind this letter. I cannot help feeling as I do, and I hope that you will bear in mind that at my best I am better than this. I have been brooding for so long about so many things which are unjust and wasteful, or even downright malicious, that I do not like the temper of my mind, and know that I am unwell and becoming increasingly so all the time. I am afraid of what is happening to me. At my very worst I have been a carefree writer, but I have never been corrupt or dishonest or unfair, and these things, whether in other men or in the forces which act upon men, offend and hurt me. I cannot see them taken for granted. I cannot see them accepted and used as though they were the virtues by which we live, and by which we hope to carry live life to others. They hurt me. Being thus hurt, without relief, for so long I am very ill, and a stranger to myself. I do not like any notion of escape, and yet I find myself feeling that I had better be dead and done with. But I have a wife and a son and a mother who look to me for the continuance of their lives. And yet what good am I to them or to myself, embittered, strange, speechless, graceless, and full of hate? And I have charged myself, I survived, to remove my family forever from my country, which I have always loved because my country does not want me. I am ashamed that this feeling exists in me, but it is so. It does exist, and I don't like it. It exists because I have been made ill. I know I need rest, but I don't know what to do about it. If I do my work, or if I'm in a position to do it, that is rest for me. It is the source of my health. But I have neither worked nor rested these twenty tortuous, endless, hopeless months. I cannot understand what is wanted of me. I am physically and temperamentally unfit for any kind of life or work other than my own. I have been denied that life and that work. No man, let alone a writer, could endure such an unnatural reversal for, for long without a break of one sort or another. I have been on the verge of breaking from the beginning. I do not want to break, and I know I can be broken. It is weak and disgraceful to feel persecuted, but suppose it is unavoidable. Suppose it's true. Is it then disgraceful to make it known? Last September, when my wife was about to give birth to my son, I suffered an attack of pain in the right side of my lower back and down the leg and was unable to report for duty. This condition was known to the Army medical officers, and on other occasions when similar attacks had taken place, I had been permitted to take care of myself at home, as I had done in civilian life. And in a day or two I had been well enough to return to duty. But on this occasion, an ambulance was sent for me, and I was removed to the hospital at Fort J. This was on a Saturday. By Monday, the pain had gone. X-ray photographs of my back were taken, and I was given an examination. The examining officers sh shocked and humiliated me, so by their manner, and questions and requests that I could not, in honor, not protest, what I, which I did. They then walked away to another room, and when I went there for the upper part of my pajamas, it was thrown at me with contempt. 
The following day, I was ordered to be examined by an army psychiatrist, and several days later I was removed to Halloran General Hospital in Staten Island and placed in the ward for psychoneurotics. I was permitted to leave the hospital to be with my wife when she gave birth to my son. Early in October, I was informed, after appearing before an examining board, that I was to be discharged from the army because of simple adult maladjustment. While I was at the hospital, three or four other enlisted men were separated from the service on the same grounds. On October 12th, I signed my discharge certificate and was told I would leave the hospital the following morning. The following morning, however, I was told that my discharge had been held up. On October 3rd, I was ordered back to duty on the grounds that there was no evidence of insanity in me. I was given a furlough of one month in which to try to get over the ordeal, just ended, and to prepare for the one ahead, which I would be forced to return to a post in which gossip had put me down as insane. Several days after my return, I was alerted for duty overseas, detached service for a period of 90 days, which ended in May. Since I have been overseas, I have had repeated attacks of unbearable pain. That is, briefly, with a very great deal omitted, only a little of the history of my life in the Army. I am almost 36 years of age. In 10 years as an American writer, I have published 15 books, two of which have been reprinted for troops by the Council on Books in Wartime, and a third by the British. I believed your assignment would save my life, but now I am very tired and very ill, and I want to go home. I cannot talk to anyone. I am ashamed to do so. But I would like to know of anyone who is more eager to do anything he can with whatever skill he has, for all people, for truth, for decency, and for right. I can no longer permit myself to be hopeful for justice for myself. Hoping has hurt me too much. But at the same time, I cannot permit myself to believe my own sickly brooding that we are, we inhabit a corrupt world and are ourselves hopelessly corrupt. All I know is that I am terribly alone and very much in need of help. Yours respectfully, William Saroyan, Private First Class, Army Pictorial Service. Let's put this on the Saroyan map and move on.